We love Vermont too, Casey, but we got to talk about this, that, and way more. What's up, Degenerates? It's the Disc Golf World, and we got you covered with everything you need to know from the Green Mountain Championships. I'm Jefferson, and alongside me as always, the one with all the holes in his game, Swiss Cheese. Quick shout out to everyone supporting on the Patreon and our members. We're solely funded by the fans, so literally without you guys, we wouldn't be able to bring you our coverage. So if you want to see your name, check out the link in the description. GMC happens to be one of the most liked tournaments among pros, and from the property, it makes sense. Two beautiful courses that have been around for years. Testing players' abilities to hit gaps and lines, rather than to throw the extended distances for no reason besides trying to add some sort of challenge. It's kind of like using a salsa top as a mini. No real reason but for the attention. We heard talk from professionals about how aspects of disc golf is being forgotten, and these courses bring it back out. Evan Scott allegedly made a comment about finally being able to shape shots instead of basically throwing out his arm. My only issue with the courses, and it might be a nitpick, but hey, I'm the guy who won, so might as well take advantage. I never like when spectators have to cross a fairway in order to get places. What other professional sport do you actively go through the playing area while the event's going on? It creates moments when fans accidentally walk in the way of pros. And sure, we can call the wambulance as some like to say, but when you're playing for the last chance to get into the tour championship, I would like as little distraction as possible. I overheard an interesting conversation as I watched this exact thing go down. Well, one of many. A player said as he waited on the tee pad, let's let them cross so they're out of mind, which was responded with, that's already impossible. So can we stop designing spectator walkways in the middle of fairways? And if you have no other choice, I think it would be appropriate to have a trusted volunteer man that station. I know it's possible because I remember the Music City Open. Unfortunately, that's the only instance I can remember at the top of my head. However, the list is long of tournaments that use courses that still grant access to the public during the event, or at least they did a shitty job enforcing the rules. The other problem that needs to be fixed soon is DGN and the streaming issues. Although I wasn't watching the live stream, it's hard to ignore the comments that flood every social media that disc golfers are on. We talked about weird optics, but what about when fans don't even have the ability to watch the product? The push can't be for everyone to use this app when week after week it's filled with complaints. At this point, it's set up to look bad. As you can tell, the comments are not going easy. Not sure if there is a solution moving forward, but hopefully there could be something done. As there's too many people threatening to pull their subscriptions, and from everything else we've seen in the disc golf industry this year, not sure how much of a hit can be taken. Brody's back. Well, not for the tournament, but on X. After his account was hacked, he would have to take a brief hiatus from the app. Didn't take him long before he was back at it discussing his favorite topic when replying to this post from Zach Melton, which talks about Ganon's insane 16 under round 2. Currently, the rating sits at 1096, just below that elusive 1100 Melton believes it deserves. Ezra Aderhold then jumps into the conversation to bring up the point that there weren't enough lower rated players to balance out the scores in order for the rating to have the boost. That's of course when Brody chimed in. Drop in the comments what you think, because at the end of the day, Gannon shot 16 under, and I think that's the important part. The other nonsense, I care about as much as Parker Welk did this putt. Sorry man, but you did tell me to put it in the video. Honestly, I don't care about ratings. However, I'm also not going to be the guy to tell anyone not to care about what they spent their money to get. Unless it's a buzzsaw. No one needs three. Speaking of useless things, let's talk playoffs. Just kidding. I actually think we saw the concept play out. If you don't know what the hell playoffs are supposed to be, here's DGPT president Jeff Spring to give a quick explanation. The top 100 MPO and the top 50 FPO automatically qualify for this. Both of these events count. You can't drop them. They're undroppable. They're going to count. A lot of people vying for the top 32 and 20, 32 spots for MPO, 20 spots for FPO in the Tour Championship. That Tour Championship is directly influenced by these two playoff events. Players have to keep their scores. They have to be here. In order to get into that top 32, a lot of them have to perform. So it's going to be very interesting to watch that cut line as well as who's going to win these tournaments this weekend. Since these two events can't be dropped, placements actually matter with the extra points. Players like Eagle McMahon were questioned prior to the event on their standing. But look as Eagle jumped from the bubble to inside without worry. This is also a chance for the middle of the pack of the 32 to make that final jump in points. 
to hopefully secure a better stroke advantage for the championship. It makes these events matter just a tad bit more. However, the field is supposed to be limited, but in reality, they invite players ranked as low as 149th. Actually, there's people ranked even further down, but they aren't on the standings to tell. Sort of strange that there isn't a true cutoff for the postseason. For the future, there needs to be some criteria to help balance qualifiers from Europe, especially with the heavier overseas schedule next season, because I know this might sound like a stretch, but hear this hypothetical out. Our friend Connor O'Reilly played this tournament. What if he won? He's currently ranked outside the top 100, which was beyond the cut line, but every event winner automatically gets into the championship. Would be weird optics if someone got in from an event they weren't technically eligible to play in the first place. Just a thought. And now that it's out there, hopefully there could be a solution. For now, stick around till the MPO recap to see how much the standings changed up, and if the playoffs actually mean something. But first, Swiss, hit the people with the FPO. Beth at 69. I just told myself, you've got to will this one in there. Whatever you have, just will it in there. This man is unbelievable. This is what athletes live for. This is the moment. Some of the best FPO action we have seen on the season and a battle among four pros. It started with a day three that would beat Tatar's worst over the four days with only a two under round. Tatar would miss three birdies looking from within the circle, the shortest being 25 feet while also adding three straight bogeys at one point. Instead, Missy Gannon was putting together a course record-setting performance, 10-under, bogey-free round, that had her climbing all the way back into contention from Chase Card and finishing 16-under, tied with Tatar. Missy was hitting fairways and perfect from within the circle on the day, while Owen was right behind her with a 9-under herself, including a 142-foot birdie throw-in. The difference being was her single bogey, or she would have been tied with Missy on the day. That being said, still would have a share of the lead, one stroke ahead of Missy Gannon and Kristen, while Silva Sarnen quietly put together a 7-under round on her worst putting performance over the entire weekend, missing five putts from within the circle and actually lost strokes on the putting green. Strange, since Silva averages over 80% in C1X, second only to Holly Finley. Two of those misses resulted in her only bogeys on the day. But Silva was that strong off the tee, was second in strokes gained tee to green during the day, led in fairway hits, and still hit two of three putts from C2 despite her putting woes from short distance. Setting the stage for one of the tightest races the FPO has seen on the season, with an entire lead card separated by a single stroke. Three of the biggest names in the FPO and arguably the best young talent on top of that. Even with Kristen starting the round off with a bogey and Missy never being able to get anything going, still had enough excitement as Owen was hitting highlight putt after highlight putt early. All of them being from distance as she had a 54-footer on one, a 57-footer two holes later for another birdie, and a 49-footer she needed to save par on four. I say needed because Silva was the only one to keep pace in that span with two birdies herself, including a C2 make also, hers being for a birdie. Owen would get the lead on five though as Silva's poor tee shot would result in her first bogey. Silva would recover with four straight birdies, bookend with two more C2 makes as she took control and was in position to get her first Elite Series victory here in the States. She would have a four-stroke lead over Own and a six over Kristen, heading into the final five holes. But it would all go downhill from there. Tatar would pick up a stroke on 14 with an easy birdie and two more the very next hole, taking advantage of Silva hitting an early tree. Silva, with now only a two-stroke lead, would have another errant tee shot off the fairway on her very next drive, but recovered with a great out and an even better approach for a par look save, with no apparent damage as Tatar was looking at par also. Silva would end up missing that 15-foot par save, resulting in a bogey and her lead down to a single stroke. Some would consider that a choke job, but let's be honest, Silva's only beaten Tatar one time in her career, making that putt that much more pressure-packed for anyone, including one of the best young putters in the sport who is yet to win outside of Europe. After that, the two would go par-par on the next hole, setting the stage for a battle that would come down to Fox Run's iconic hole 18. Kristen, in classic fashion, hits the center of the fairway in near-perfect position. Silva responds with yet another poor tee shot, this one finishing OB, ultimately resulting in a now playoff back on 18 where Silva just aired. 
In the playoff, both would be clean off the tee this time and each placing their approaches near circle's edge, both needing to hit the putt for a chance at victory. Silva was the furthest out and first to act. Despite most rooting for Tatar, fans were willing Silva's putt in as they didn't want the action to stop. However, her putt not only lipped out, but also caught edge and rolled OB, being forced to putt again, knowing Tatar simply would lay up. But credit needs to go to Silva, who held her emotions together to finish the action, and despite not getting the victory, still received her highest cash of her career. That victory has also tightened up the Player of the Year talks with only three events left to play. The two frontrunners are Tatar, who now has five Elite Series wins, with one of those being an Elite Plus event, and now a playoff win on top of that, while still also having a major. The other is Evelina Salonen, with two major victories and two Elite wins on the season. I still favor Evelina's major victories, even with Tatar's impressive season while missing time on the year due to injury. But it's important to note that injury did not affect any majors on the season also, as Evelina's two majors were with Tatar in attendance. But I admit, if Tatar can grab another win, the edge certainly slips in her favor. And while we're talking about it, hey Springs, when are we getting that media vote for the Disc Golf World already? You know the guys who've attended more events in person than the rest of your media personalities have combined. Over on the MPO side, Gannon Burr decided he didn't want anyone else to win this tournament. After his 16 under on day two, it would be insane to think anyone else is going to take this away from the flat bill enthusiast. By the final day, he extended his lead bigger than this Gavin Babcock sandwich. The only person who made it interesting was Ricky Waisaki, and he went into the round down by seven strokes. This would be Gannon's seventh victory of the season, and instead of receiving praise from the community, I saw nothing but negativity. I was still in middle school when Macbeth was in his true dominance era, so I don't remember the public perception then. But did he get this much hate from when he walked over the field? Because all I hear looking back is how incredible it was. Now, Gannon's doing similar numbers, not even to the full extent, and all I see is how bad for the sport he is. And not just for the Lego building antics. I even heard that statement from professionals, which feels so strange to me. How can you not like the kid because he's too good? If you can't handle the self-abuse or overanalyzing, just give him some time. It's not like there's a book on how to handle being the greatest in your field as a teenager. We had the chance to ask Gannon how he felt about the hate he constantly gets, and this is how he responded. Pretty much every player does it. I might just get a little more flack than uh, other people, but maybe it's because I am younger or I want to win these tournaments, so I have a reason to kind of back, up, back it up if I have some critiques for the course. And so I have a place like Deglo, where, you know, it's not my favorite course. So there's definitely a bunch of critiques I'd make. I wanted to win. That way, you know, people aren't just going to be like, well, you just played bad. So that's why you're, you know, talking crap about the course, you know, so... Yeah, I definitely read the comments uh, on stuff like that. I don't know. I think people just need to maybe take it from a different perspective, kind of see where we're at as players and what we're having to deal with. When you win by seven, you deserve solo attention for the effort. So that's all I'm going to recap. Other than Eagle making his official jump into the Tour Championship, there was little movement after the playoff event. We'll have to see if that changes next week. That's everything you need to know from the first playoff event of the season, the Green Mountain Championship. Next up, we have the MVP Open at Maple Hill. I've been waiting a year to chill with the eight holes, drink some beer, and watch disc golf. So if you see me there, definitely say what's up. And to not miss out on anything, make sure to subscribe to the Disc Golf World. Yep, yeah, that's perfect. What a shot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Follow me on uh, discgolfworld.com. Buy the merch. Thank you. Shh. <laughs>